Hi, thank you, Whitney. Um, it's so great to be here, everyone. Uh, it's just, the April conference is always an exciting time. Hi, I'm Tannis Hargrove. I'm the RTC. I work at the RTC Rural at the University of Montana. Um, I'll start with my visual description. I am a fair-skinned, middle-aged woman uh, with brown curly hair, red glasses, and an orange sweater. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, and I couldn't be more excited to be here with you all today. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen so that you can see. I'm going to bring this over here uh, so that you can see my slides. Here we go. We're going to start the slideshow and then, sorry about that, swap. Okay, there we go. So we're going to talk a little bit about hosting independent living workshops online, um, particularly online using Zoom. Uh, and I would like to say just to, uh, once again, welcome. It's Thursday, what I like to call Friday Junior. So thank you so much for being here uh, and joining me today. I have a quick disclosure. Um, and I, I actually, sorry, before I get started, I need to make sure on my screen share that I, I have a video in here for you. And I wanna make sure that I have that set up. Oh gosh, okay, minimize. So I need to go back to share my sound. Okay, I don't want you to miss out on that. Share. All right, we're back to screen sharing, which should be better. And okay, here we go. <laughs> I have to start with a disclosure that the contents of this presentation were developed under a grant from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. The contents and opinions expressed reflect those of the authors, um, reflect those of the authors, sorry, and are not necessarily those of the funding agency and should not assume endorsement by the federal government. Uh, for today's presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about independent living workshops, hosting workshops at your CIL, consumer outreach and recruitment, uh, facilitating online workshops with Zoom, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit more about our program uh, called Healthy Community Living and how you might want to use that at your Center for Independent Living and Zoom for your independent living workshops. So we'll talk a little bit more about what healthy community living is and the programs that are existing currently within it. Um, those programs are community living skills, which we'll talk more about, living well in the community, working well with a disability, and then there's also a facilitating groups training. <clears throat> so first I wanted to talk a little bit more about just hosting workshops in general. So how does it work? What does it look like? What do people do? Uh, what are they doing out there at Centers for Independent Living? So typically uh, one staff member, usually it's an IL coordinator, um, sometimes it's the executive director, just depending on who, who wants to do it and who has the time. Um, typically one staff member takes the lead, um, sometimes it's two staff members. We recommend that you use two so that you have someone to facilitate and co-facilitate with. Um, usually those two people work together as a team to schedule a workshop. Workshops for our program specifically, we suggest they go for 11 weeks. That first week includes an orientation that is a little shorter, just helps people get the bumps and bumps out of the way um, before you dig into more of the content. So typically, for example, you may choose to host a workshop for 11 weeks, and it's usually once a week for two hours. Um, you schedule a start date. For example, you might choose Wednesdays at one o'clock. So we're using that as the example throughout this presentation. I just wanted to give you guys something firm to grab onto. Um, then those, co those facilitator and co-facilitator familiarize themselves with Zoom or whatever online platform you, you guys like best. It could also be Microsoft Teams, Google Meets. There's lots of stuff uh, out there. And then they assist their consumers in walking through the process of logging into Zoom and joining meetings with Zoom so that their consumers are able to join the workshop. Uh, facilitator training. So for our programs, we actually provide as part of the license, we provide facilitator training for all of the workshops, which is nice. There's also a certificate that you get at the end 
Um, it's, they have lots of resources and videos and extra materials as well. Um, in addition, we offer a facilitating groups training. So if you're completely new to facilitating groups or working with workshops, um, that, that's a nice training that's also included in the healthy community living curriculum. Whatever workshop you're providing, uh, I, we recommend that you start by becoming familiar with the content that you'd like to discuss in your group. So whether it's peer support or housing or transportation, it's always good to just familiarize yourself with some of that content. And then practice using Zoom with your co-facilitator so that you can get comfortable sharing your screen, muting and unmuting, and getting used to a, little, a few of those quirks um, of how the Zoom platform works. Once you're familiar with the content, you're trained, you've chosen your date and time, you're ready to get everyone set up for Zoom. Um, some tips for using Zoom that I think are always just a good idea. Make sure that you set up your own Zoom account if that's possible. Uh, practice screen sharing, uh, like I said, with your co-facilitator or someone else in your office so that you can make sure that that work, that feature works. Check your audio settings. Um, knowing how to mute and unmute, practicing turning your video on and off, um, also making sure that you're able to look at the chat feature. The chat feature is a nice way for people to participate without having to mute or unmute. They can type their thoughts as you go. Um, and because Zoom is a little bit different on the computer versus a tablet or a phone, it's sometimes nice to check out using Zoom with different devices. We also have quite a few online resources as well as some videos on helping consumers use Zoom on the Healthy Community Living website. And I provided the link directly to those online resources here. Um, so you can check those out as well. One of the other questions that we often get about workshops is the recruitment. So how do you get, how do people get participants for their workshops? Well, that's a great question. Um, one of the, I think one of the strategies is there's lots of different ways to do it. Some things that we've heard, I just listed here. So oftentimes people email out flyers. Sometimes they mail them out, like print off a flyer, put it in an envelope, send it out to all their consumer lists. It's also really important to let your community partners or people who refer to your Center for Independent Living, let them know about the workshop. Let them know what the workshop is, when it is, when it starts, all of those details so that if they have people who might be interested, they can send them your way. <clears throat> also, letting all the IL specialists in your organization know about the workshop is a great way to get consumers to participate in the workshop with you. So they may have consumers that they think are a good fit or who are interested in doing something more, and then you'll be able to recruit those individuals to participate in the workshop with you. Also contact other organizations. Maybe they don't give you referrals, but they are you know, within your community. Um, for example, the food bank or other organizations where people might um, have, cons have consumers or people who are interested in participating with you. Uh, post your workshop details on social media and the website. If you have some, some centers have really robust websites where they use things like Eventbrite. Um, so they have a sign up page on their website or have them attend um, outreach events virtually. So we've also had IL staff members go and do little mini presentations on Zoom to other staff members or to other community organizations about their workshops. Just again, getting the word out to get it started. These are just a few recruitment strategies um, that I wanted to share just in thinking about sort of our new digital world and how to get people to attend the workshops. So once you have your people interested, uh, we always recommend about 10 people per workshop. It's a nice group um, that gives you, in case a few people aren't there, it still gives you lots of, uh, lots of time for ample discussion. And then once you have, so once you have everyone, you can start onboarding. Um, so you wanna follow up with any consumers who are interested and begin registering them for the workshop. Um, and as part of registration for the workshop, oftentimes there's, depending on your organization, you may have 
a specific information that you need to collect. You may work on an independent living plan. Oftentimes, as part of the independent living plan, uh, consumers are asked to set a goal, which is a really nice um, sort of segue into maybe why they want to attend the workshop or what they might want to work on for that amount of time. Um, so whatever is needed for your organization, you want to make sure and complete that paperwork and then start talking and assessing their technology needs. So because the workshops would be on, in this case, we're using Zoom as the example, um, we, you would want to talk to them about, do they need a device? So for our programs, we actually are able to provide devices that's happening more and more. Lots of centers for independent living have, you know, 10 iPads or 10 tablets. Lots of people are, have smartphones. So in many cases, people have a device where they're able to connect to Zoom and to the internet. And so it's really just a matter of helping them do that um, on the device that they have. So kind of asking some questions to figure that out. Um, then one of the things I wanted to highlight is that Zoom, what's great about Zoom, and I feel like an olden timer even saying this, but this, I still, this still works really well, is that we're, I feel like there's a lot of push towards Zoom and participating on Zoom with video. But the other thing about Zoom is you can still call in with a landline. And if, you're, if you have an organizational account on Zoom, that landline can even be connected to an 800 number. So Zoom allows people to participate both with the video, with a tablet, with a computer, but also with a cell phone, with a landline. Um, and there's still a lot of rich content you can get by joining via phone. Um, so then figuring out what works best for each consumer. Would it be working on the phone? What type of device? Helping them understand Zoom best and what works best for them. And then also figuring out how they'll receive reminders about the workshop. So for some people, they want to get a text. Uh, you can actually work with Google Voice so that you can text links on Zoom to your consumers, um, which is a nice way to just get it right to their phones. Some people you can email. So figuring out what works best or phone calls, oftentimes calling the day of the workshop or the day before to remind people that it's happening is a really important part of getting individuals to the workshop uh, once it starts happening. Okay, um, so I wanted to give an example of just what an online workshop format might look like just to help you guys, help everyone conceptualize how does this actually work. So we all get on Zoom and this is just kind of a breakdown of what that two hours might look like. So if we're meeting on Wednesdays from one o'clock to three o'clock, that sounds like a pretty large amount of time. But I wanted to break it up so that we can all see, you're probably gonna spend about 15 to 20 minutes settling in, doing a group icebreaker. Uh, then you're gonna maybe do 15 minutes of content slides. So talking about goal setting, for example, and what people's goals might be, that might lead into a group discussion about, okay, what, you know, really talk, digging in more further to what those goals are, the details, maybe writing a goal statement. And now it's been about 45 minutes, so you're gonna take a break. Um, the, you can still take breaks on Zoom. People can turn off their cameras, they can leave them on. Um, but that always gives people a nice opportunity to use the restroom, get some water, grab a cup of coffee. Then they're going to come back from the 15 minute break and you're going to go back into content slides, have another group discussion for about 45 minutes to, an, up to 50 minutes, I would say. And then it's time to wrap up. So as you can see, two hours sounds like a lot, but I wanted to just highlight here that this actually goes pretty quickly. Um, and in our experience, there's lots of really rich, good discussion that comes out of it. So that's an example of what a workshop might look like online. And then I wanted to post this picture because this is kind of our new world. Um, so here's just a picture actually of me and many of my coworkers as we got together for a group meeting. But this is similar to what a workshop would look like once everyone was logged in. I know many of you who've done this, this is probably not novel at all. 
Um, you can see I'm here in the middle taking a photo. We have just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people. Well, seven people logged on on their video. Everyone's just kind of looking at the camera. And then one person who's logged in via phone. So you can see that the different ways that people are able to connect and what a workshop might look like once you get started. So what is healthy community living? So healthy community living is a group of online workshops that are ready to use. Uh, we have done a lot of the heavy lifting for you and they work really nicely with the Zoom platform. Um, it's a series of group workshops for people with disabilities which include group discussions on topics relevant to their lives. So like I said, housing, transportation, peer support, disability identity, goal setting. We'll talk a lot more about all that's included. Um, facilitators present slides from the HCL website to consumers, either in person, it was originally written to be used in person, but it can also be used online using Zoom, uh, which is what we're focusing on today, or some combination of both, um, depending how things uh, move forward. So the workshops focus on quality of life, building self-determination, relatedness, autonomy, and supports. Um, and they really foster peer connections in an independent living setting. So healthy community living includes which programs? So we have three peer-led independent living skills workshops and facilitator trainings that go along with those. The three programs are called community living skills, living well in the community, and working well with a disability. Both of those have content for presenting to consumers on Zoom. I'll show you that in just a minute. And then also facilitator trainings and lots of online resources for you all as well. Uh, there is in also included, and so the Healthy Community Living Program, I just wanna quickly cover, um, is $500 annually, and that would be purchased by your organization or your Center for Independent Living, and then you would get access to all three of these 11-week workshops, as well as the facilitator trainings and the facilitating groups training, which is nice for anyone to just bolster their facilitation skills or learn to facilitate groups, um, whether you've just started or you've been doing it for a long time. So you do have to buy, you do have to purchase a license to get access to these programs and you purchase that from us on our website. I'll show the website at the end of this presentation. Um, but I, I do think that it's a really nice way to, to engage with your consumers, to engage with consumers who have transportation barriers or and who may be interested in doing a workshop and meeting other people like them. Okay, so that's what healthy community living includes, and that's kind of the licensing. I want to go more in depth into each of these programs so you can learn a little bit more about them. So healthy community living is for anyone, and it can be a great way to connect with consumers, reduce isolation, and help people meet their goals while staying at home. Um, it includes the facilitating groups training, uh, and that's an online facilitator training program where you can learn at your own pace. So it's all done at your own pace. It's intended for professional development and training of centers for independent living or, uh, or other organizational staff. It helps you learn general tips and skills to be a strong facilitator of any group or workshop. Um, and it's not specific to working with any of our programs. It's just really to help guide facilitators to learn and increase their skills for presenting. The facilitating group training topics include um, foundations, relationships, active listening, behavior change, sharing your story, asking questions, accessibility, direct communication, referrals, and facilitator self-care. I have some photos here on the slide as well. We have actually at a previous April conference, we have a group of people holding up signs. We have a group of people bouncing a beach ball. We have a group, it looks like a group presentation um, and then people in a group having a discussion. Um, so that's the facilitating groups training. I wanted to show this, this is the facilitating groups homepage so that hopefully you guys can get a sense of what it looks like. Um, 
I, all these are all the session topics that I just mentioned. Uh, so this is what sort of the training homepage looks like if you logged into the training page. If you clicked on, for example, foundations uh, here, um, I'm showing you actually the relationship session, sorry. So if you clicked on relationships, this is actually a screenshot from the website of what that would look like. And at the top, we have the session title relationships. And then across the slide, we have tabs with different tabs of different information. So within the relationship session, the, top, the tab topics are introduction, boundaries, ethics, personal boundaries, limits. Then there's a self-assessment and reflection and resources. So you can see here that this is just the introduction to the relationships tab, uh, which has some content just relating to Facilitators may develop relationships with participants in an effort to enhance participants' growth and help them learn about themselves. So it's really just introductory content to help you kind of frame, frame up thinking about relationships and in the context of facilitating a group. And then there's also some learning objectives at the bottom, and there's learning objectives for each of the sessions. Um, in this case, the learning objectives for this session are gain a better understanding of the facilitator and participant relationships and the boundaries within that relationship, and then understanding how and why setting boundaries is key to maintaining an ethical relationship with participants. So that's just a quick overview of what that looks like if you were just to click past the homepage of the facilitating groups training. And then this is an example here. I have a picture of um, two men. Uh, one's both are looking at the camera. Um, and this is an example of what a slide would look like. So this is what facilitators would actually present to their groups. Um, and it has here, and this is a content slide. So it says relationships and boundaries, types of boundaries. And so some example areas where we might create boundaries include time, personal space, actions, or other group members. Um, so I just wanted you guys to be able to see this to get a sense of what kind of content is included in each of these programs. And we'll go through um, content slides for some of the other programs as well. So in addition, so that's the facilitating groups training, which is just intended to be a training. The next program included in Healthy Community Living uh, is Community Living Skills which is an 11-week workshop within the Healthy Community Living Program. It's focused on building skills for living independently, and it includes an online facilitator training. Uh, community Living Skills participants can build support with the networks with peers. They explore options and possibilities for setting personal goals. Uh, they get information on skills and resources for living and participating in the community and they build confidence and comfort in decision-making and problem-solving. Uh, community living skills workshops include topics, include the orientation, disability identity, peer support, self-advocacy, self-care, housing, technical skills, budgeting and finance, transportation, and time use. And I have some photos here of a group um, a group from California playing uh, catch with water balloons on the beach uh, with some adaptive equipment, it looks like. We have um, two women, sorry, two women rolling on a trail, a woman getting into a taxi, and then three men having a discussion outside what looks like a courthouse. Um, so, and with the logo for community living skills. This is the Community Living Skills homepage. Um, again, I just wanted to give you a sense of what the program actually looks like. So this is the homepage. If you were to log into the website, you'll see here again, it has the orientation and just the topic names that I just mentioned um, with a small photo, thumbnail photo above. The Community Living Skills Disability Identity session. So, Let's pretend that I clicked the homepage, I clicked disability identity, that thumbnail, and now here I am with disability identity as the session title. And the, the tab titles across the top are introduction, disclosure, labels and stereotypes, discrimination, accommodations, adjustments and acknowledgement, 
and then resources. So this is actually the page that you might use to present to your consumers. Um, and then it has introductory content about disability identity underneath the introduction title. And it says there are many ways to identify with disability and how you choose to identify is personal and unique to you. And so there's lots of information here on these tabs. I also wanted to highlight down here at the bottom of the slide, we have three buttons. The buttons say defining disability, visible and invisible disabilities, and the hands activity. So you can click on those buttons. And if we clicked on a button, I'm gonna to move to the next slide. This is an example when you click on the button of the content, this is a content slide that might pop up. This is an example of a CLS content slide. The con there is a photo of um, a visually impaired man walking with his, cane, with his white cane on the sidewalk, and it says defining disability. Disability is defined in many different ways. Services you seek out might have their own definition. For example, Social Security defines disability as a medical impairment that keeps you from working or otherwise gainfully getting money. Disability may be created by the barriers in our communities. For example, if there are stairs but no ramp into a building, people who use wheelchairs are disabled in that case. You can be born with your disability, acquire it through a life experience like an accident, or have it show up through the aging process. And these slides, I'm not using the website today because it's more difficult to do with all the with the presentation, but these slides can be adjusted to fit the size of the screen that you're using. So they can be full screen for your um, participants, which is also nice as they're participating in a workshop on Zoom. So that's an example of a community living skills content slide. Here's an example of an activity slide. So in this, um, in this photo, we have a woman who looks like she's pondering or maybe taking notes. Um, in the background, and then it's the knowing yourself activity. So knowing yourself, it says, in preparing to advocate or consider advocating for yourself, you might ask yourself the following questions. What do you feel comfortable or uncomfortable with? What is hard for you? What's important to you? What are your deal breakers? What are your values? And what do you need help with? So this might be an example of a group discussion. So you might have people respond silently or you might have people just immediately start talking. But I, I wanted to highlight that this is an example of a discussion that you might have if you were doing the community living skills program. Okay, so that's community living skills. And um, next we have living well in the community. Uh, which was formerly Living Well with a Disability, and it used to be in workbooks. Um, we've adapted this to the web-based form. It's also an 11-week program within the Healthy Community Living Program. Um, it's focused on setting goals to improve overall quality of life and well-being, and it's adapted from our older work workbook, Living Well with a Disability. Um, living well in the community, participants identify what's meaningful to them, and then they set a quality of life goal. They make progress towards the goals they set by applying problem solving skills and managing emotions like frustration and discouragement. They discover tools and skills that can make goal, achievements e goal achievement easier, like communicating effectively and finding important resources. They explore ways to improve their overall health by changing daily habits. They practice self-advocacy and systems advocacy to help make changes to support them and others in living well. Living well in the community, this is an example of the living well in the community homepage. Again, it just has the session topics with small thumbnails. I'm gonna skip quickly to, these are the workshop topics. Uh, orient, there's an orientation goal setting, building support, healthy reactions, staying on course, healthy communication, seeking information, eating well, physical activity, advocacy, and maintenance. Um, and we have a few photos here. We have a, a mother and a son at an, uh, getting an ice, ice cream in an ice cream truck, um, a woman and a man doing adaptive yoga, we have uh, someone getting uh, someone. We have a man in a wheelchair wheeling down the airport, and then we have 
uh, someone getting maybe off a bus, it looks like, or paratransit perhaps onto the sidewalk um, off of the lift. So this is an example of what the Living Well in the Community session and slides look like. So I just took a quick pick of what the Eating Well session looks like. So again, you see the tabs across the top, they have introduction, what is a healthy diet, making changes, planning ahead, and resources. There's some introductory content that begins with, you eat not only to live, but to participate in your community, to celebrate, to enjoy the taste, and to feel good. And then the buttons at the bottom uh, are food choices, the meaning of food, and benefits of a healthy diet. If you were to click on one of those buttons, I have a content slide here. Uh, we have our good friend, Mike Beers, who looks like he's grabbing uh, bubbly water out of the fridge. Uh, yeah, bubbly water out of the fridge. And this is a discussion content. This is a discussion slide. So it says strategies and discussion. What challenges do you foresee in changing your food choices and eating habits? And how might you solve some of these challenges? So this is an example of questions that you might ask and content you would present as part of the Living Well in the Community program to your consumers. And then they would have a discussion about how they might solve some of their food challenges. Okay, then working well with a disability is meant to build on the Living Well in the Community program. And working well focuses on the balance between health and transition to employment. Um, and working well, this is the example of what the working well homepage looks like. Um, it has a little bit, it has only one, two, it has seven sessions instead of 10. Um, and it has thumbnails with the session topics here on the homepage. The session topics for working well include an orientation, working for your values, the great balancing act, stress and working well, the power of advocacy, balancing through physical activity, eating well to live well, and maintaining a healthy balance. So we have some photos here, one of a desk with two screens, two women presenting um, at the April conference, uh, a woman using a computer, and then it looks like two individuals uh, kind of sitting next to each other also working on a laptop. So working well, I, again, I have here an example of what a session looks like. This is the Great Balancing Act session. The tab titles across the top are introduction, keeping balanced, using information, making a plan, and resources. Uh, the buttons are using time wisely, an example from Daniel, who's a character within the, the content, and where does my time go? I put an example of a content slide here. This is the house of working well, which talks, which talks about how you spend your time in different activities, contributing to your life balance. So using your time wisely, spending time, um, and then it has the different areas of the house. So emotional, physical, spiritual, social, intellectual, work, relationships, chores, and free time. Just to give you a sense of what work, like a little bit more in depth about working well with a disability. Okay, what have participants said about these programs? So participants said, I learned I can help. I learned I can help others if they need to help, if they need help by giving them resources. The classes were rewarding and resourceful. I learned how to advocate and eat healthier. I also learned how to identify reactions and how to converse with others. I learned that inside disabilities are important to keep in mind and advocate for myself. Our material was very useful and informative. So that's what participants who went through the program, just a quick overview of what they had to say. I also wanted to mention that within the Healthy Community Living Program, we have the facilitator trainings, which I've mentioned for all three community living skills, living well in the community and working well with a disability. There's also recruitment brochures that you can print, you can email, you can also just use logos or materials and make your own. That's all provided for you. Uh, we also provide certificates of completion for your consumers and also for the facilitators when you complete the facilitator training. 
Uh, there's additional resources for each weekly session, including full length videos, additional worksheets and supplementary information. And there's also lots of photos and videos of real people in real places. Um, next, I'm going to play a video from our, our partners um, who are staff members at Centers for Independent Living across the United States. Um, and I want to read the inter I want to read the video descriptions of each of the individuals, and then I'll play the video. So we have a montage of staff from the Centers for Independent Living who facilitated healthy community living workshops. They're sharing their experiences. Um, it's alternating speakers throughout. We have Jessica Adkins from Access Two, a woman with long wavy red hair, Charles Oaks from Disability Partners a man with brown gray hair and a short mustache and beard, Kelly Ritter from Future Choices Incorporated, a woman with long brown hair and glasses, Susan Ragsdale from Disability Partners, a woman with short blonde, short blonde hair and glasses, Cassie Waitman from Montana Independent Living Project, a woman with long wavy dark hair and red glasses, and Casey Schmidt from Wyoming Independent Living, a man with short brown hair, a thick brown mustache and beard and glasses. Okay, so I'm gonna play this for you now. Um, so transportation is a huge barrier. So having them online definitely um, helped us get participants to our workshop. A lot of uh, the folks that attended had transportation issues, uh, didn't have vehicles or ways to get there and the online format was ideal. It's nice that you don't have to worry about being sick or getting anyone's germs or getting other people sick, being around a large group of people. Um, another thing that's nice about having online workshops instead of in person is that you can do the workshop from wherever you are. So if you're in the car traveling, you can still join in on the workshop, or if you're at home, you can join in from a computer or a tablet. And if you have to leave, you can take the workshop with you. So that's been really nice too. The others in the group either because of their disability or because of the distance and transportation. Um, I think it was, they would not have been able to participate. Did also have um, some younger participants and some of them were also doing school at the same time. Um, they were doing the healthy community living workshops. So having the workshops on Zoom was nice because one participant was actually able to do the workshops while she was at her school. I think our attendance was better in that first group because they would have faced transportation barriers. And um, that would have just been more time committed every week to the group and the expense of gas. And I also think um, once we got past that initial newness for some of them of being on camera and, and seeing each other on the computer, um, I think maybe people were a little more relaxed in their own environment. The online class is, um, it's more accessible to, I don't think that we would have had the attendance we had if uh, it had been uh, in person. In my experience, people seem more willing to talk when it's not faced, actually face to face. It, uh, they have a barrier that, I guess protection <laughs> that they that they feel a little safer with and they tend to open up a little bit more sometimes. Transportation is a huge barrier. So being able to do it online, we had more people come to our online workshop than we typically do an in-person workshop. Just made it a lot easier for them to fit it into their schedule. Um, also with it being online, another benefit is some people are kind of nervous to get out and be in front of people for whatever reason, um, in being able to be at home in their comfortable situation around their pets and things that they're familiar with and knowing that they can turn off their camera if they need to go do something. I felt like they just felt maybe a little bit more comfortable than they would be just being out in front of a group of people that they're not really sure about. Um, so that was definitely a positive from the online class. What we learned over time is that having an online meeting, you can get that same energy out of people if they're willing to participate. 
And then always just remembering that online that while they might not be participating, it doesn't mean they're not receiving a lot of good and quality information and, and, you know, making those kind of personal changes. So, I mean, for a lot of reasons, I feel like the online really just blew everything open to be so much more accessible to everyone. And I was expecting this class to be hard for me. And it wasn't. I was very comfortable with it. I don't know if it was just the environment that we were in, the group dynamics or what, but it wasn't anywhere near as hard as I was afraid it was going to be. It, it was a pleasant surprise. The group dynamic and the interest and the conversation was a lot easier than I expected. It just happened naturally. There was a lot of things that were a lot easier than I initially anticipated. For some reason, I had built up this class to be something that was going to be very difficult and it's going to take a long time and I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can fit it into my schedule. Yes, I can fit it into my schedule. No, it really isn't that hard to do. It's actually fun. We look forward to it every week. Um, people are engaging. People were showing up. Um, and that's something that you can't always control, but it, that part of it was definitely easier than I anticipated. And then also getting them set up, you know, to use their tablet and to use Zoom um, was a lot easier than I anticipated too. So I had really built up that this is going to be really hard and truly it wasn't. Um, it took a one meeting or a couple phone calls and really we were able to resolve any issues that they had. Um, really, the whole workshop, everything ended up being very easy to do. Um, I think sometimes when you think about it as a whole, that you have to do 11 sessions of a workshop for two hours every week, sometimes that can feel overwhelming. But when you actually get into doing the workshop, you look forward to doing the workshop. And then when it's over, you're like, oh, no, I got to start another session because I'm going to miss it. So that's been really nice. But as it progressed, friendships developed and that became a thing that, that uh, everyone looked forward to. And it gave a sounding board and allowed people to talk and get things off their chest and that they normally wouldn't have if they didn't have that group. Um, it was cool to have such a great experience um, getting to know so many people. Uh, I think personally, it definitely had a huge impact. You go through the workshop and it's hard to not have it affect you as well. Um, and so, lots of things came up about just me and things that I didn't even, I didn't even realize that, you know, so uh, in a great way too. So I feel like I both like personally and professionally, I gained a lot of skills um, that I, it was, you know, I couldn't put a value on how great the experience was. Um, and I've gotten close with some consumers who uh, I wasn't close with before. Um, so yeah, I, I really see it as just all positives, you know, like all this, I, you know, all the stress, all the things that were difficult, hundred percent worth it would do it, you know, maybe wouldn't even change anything or just do it again. I could tell a new facilitator one thing, it would be to have fun and not just have fun facilitating, but have fun with the content, have fun with your participants. And that will also help with engagement. So. I really encourage setting a goal. If you're doing living well in the community, set a goal with your participants and stick with it throughout the whole session. The last workshop that I did, I think my goal was to drink like three water bottles a day. And because of the workshop, I stuck with it. And my participants were also rooting you on, you know, they would remember your goal and then you would remember their goal. And so you're working on it together and it makes it more fun. You're going to have more fun than you think. Like this is really going to be a fun experience for you and for them. And you're going to miss it once it's over. Um, it is something that you will look forward to once a week. It may be stressful in the moment, but looking back once it's over, it goes so fast and you really do have a lot of fun. And, you know, just being able to provide that information and help people um, make connections with each other is very rewarding and gratifying and to see that develop is something that I will always take with me. Okay.
Um, so I just wanted to say another thank you so much to all of our partners who sat for interviews so that we could make that video with me, um, who've also done the programs. It's one of my favorite things is to get to work with you all. I hope some of you are out there. Um, and now I will, I just want to, we'll turn it over for Q&A and I'll take a look at those questions that you have. I wanted to mention that we do have a website for healthy community living with all the programs that I've talked about today. And that is listed here, www.healthycommunityliving.com. You can also email us if you have any questions or comments about the program, or you'd like to learn more at healthycommunityliving at mso.umt.edu. Uh, and my contact information, again, I'm Tiana Cargrove. I'm a project director at RTC Rural, and I'd love to hear from you. My email address is tanis, T-A-N-N-I-S dot Hargrove at mso.umt.edu. Um, so all of those are great contacts for us. I'm excited to hear a little bit more and maybe talk, uh, see what some of your questions are and um, start there. So let's see what questions we have. So one of the first questions that I see is, is Zoom free or do you have to pay for a Zoom call meeting workshop? So Zoom is not free. Um, you can, you do have to pay to have a Zoom account. It's about $15 a month, I believe, if you just, if you have um, one organizational account, um, which I think allows, I can't remember exactly, but maybe up to five users. Um, I don't know the specifics of Zoom, but that's on their website and we can post that as a resource for sure. Um, there's also some, there's a Zoom, there's a discount for getting Zoom available or there was for a while. I think it's still there on TechSoup um, for those of you who use TechSoup, um, but you do have to pay for Zoom. Uh, it's pretty much, it's a small nominal fee and I think most organizations have it now, um, but it is not free. So that's a great question. Thank you for answering that. And Tana, um, yeah. really quick, I was gonna say, um, I think this person might also be asking as a participant, if they're participating in a center's programming, do they have to pay for the Zoom account? Thank you for that clarification. No, the, the participant does not have to pay. So if you're, just a, if you're just joining a Zoom meeting, like for a workshop or, you know, just like this conference, well, this conference has registration, that's a bad example. So, but no, if you're just joining a Zoom meeting, it's completely free. Um, and they just have to click on the link and then they'll be entered into the Zoom room. Thank you, Sierra or Whitney or whoever. Um, second question, <laughs> how do you keep attendance up over the 11 weeks of class? Yes, I should have put this in the presentation. This is probably the most common question. Um, this is a real concern. And I think that's also what's scary about having a program for 11 weeks um, is that that sounds like a really long time. What we have found over, we've been doing programs with Centers for Independent Living and doing, and doing these workshops for about two years on Zoom now. What we have been finding is that most people, if they come to the orientation session and they come to the goal setting session, so they're able to get online for the, and, and you know, get on Zoom and they're there for the first two weeks, most people stick with it for, the, for all of the workshops. Um, that being said, I think there's lots of different things that facilitators do to engage people, lots of reminders. So oftentimes a reminder a couple of days before, a reminder on the day, um, but people become friends pretty quickly within the workshop as well. So they look forward to seeing their friends in the workshop, meeting with the facilitator. Um, oftentimes they're working on a goal, so they like talking about their progress towards their goal. Um, and we just let people we just let people know, you know, if they have healthcare appointments or whatever and they need to miss a week, that's fine, but then they can just join the following week. What's nice about the online platform as well is if they want to, they can go look at all of the content from the week that they missed. So they're able to stay caught up if that's of interest to them as well. Um, I hope that that answered your question. Uh, it looks like I have one more here. What are some examples of interactive activities that can be done in a Zoom meeting? Um, I think that there's, there's a lot of resources for this coming out and I would encourage you to look at the online resources page of our website. Um, 
there's lots of different kinds of icebreakers. Uh, we do a lot of different things like where we'll have people hold up something that's meaningful for them or maybe bring something as kind of a show and tell to sort to get to know people more. Um, there's also lots of activities and discussions within the curriculum. I would encourage you to take a look at the curriculum if you're able um, that really highlight, you know, for example, advocacy and what, you know, what your values are, getting to know your disability, helping people think about some of those things and think through that um, really based on goal setting. One of the activities is they write a, a goal statement and they do that together within the workshop, which is a really nice activity. Um, there's also quite a few other resources and I, we're adding more all the time um, to help people come up with sort of different ways to get people um, engaged on Zoom. So. Uh, I think hopefully that's what we're all learning. I think healthy community living can help. Um, I hope that that answered your question, Haley. Oh no, sorry, that's anonymous. The next one is, how can you get it where, okay, how can you get it where people can call into the Zoom meetings? That is part of, once you create a Zoom link for a meeting, there is also a phone number associated with that. So that is built into Zoom as a feature. And then it provides a call-in number and a passcode for them to type onto the phone. So that's part of Zoom. Great question. Uh, I have another one. Do you use breakout sessions within Zoom? Kay is asking. Um, you can, for sure. Uh, I know that we have experimented with that a lot. I don't personally use breakout sessions very often. Typically with a group of 10 or less, it's pretty easy to all stay in that main Zoom room and have those conversations, but you certainly could use breakout sessions and kind of give people a small assignment to break out for five or 10 minutes and then come back. And some facilitators who are, I think actually much better facilitators than myself do that. And I think they do that very successfully. So that would be another option within Zoom that would allow even more um, consumer participation. Absolutely. Thanks, great question, Kay. Other questions? Okay, well, I have, a, I guess I have about five minutes left. So I just wanted to add that we at the RTC are, are delighted to be here, but we're also always working. We are recruiting for Centers for Independent Living who are interested in completing Living Well in the Community workshops on Zoom with your consumers. Um, and we have a weekly call with facilitators where we talk about the Living Well in the Community program each week. And then we ask you to complete two workshops of Living Well in the Community within the year. And we provide incentives for your consumers. So if that's of interest to you at all or your center, please shoot me an email. Again, my email's here on the screen. It's tanis.hargrove at mso.umt.edu. Uh, we will be doing, we will be recruiting more centers for independent living for the next two years. And we would love the opportunity to work with you. Um, if you work with us on what's called the Partners for Healthy Community Living Project, which is the which is where you would do living well in the community on Zoom. Uh, we will provide you with a license for free for the help for healthy community living. So you can get a free license if you work with us. Um, and then you guys are will be asked to do two workshops of living well in the community. So I'd love to talk to you more about that if that's of interest to you. We have lots of opportunities to get involved with our research. So if you're interested in doing some research and working with us, I'd love to hear from you as well. Um, with that, I'm seeing no other questions. It is 1056, so I will let you all go. I wish you all a beautiful Friday, Junior, and I thank you so much for your time. Have a great day. Thank you, Tanis, for um, that and all the great work y'all are doing. Thank you, Whitney, for moderating, and thank you to the interpreters and to um, our cart writer. And we hope to see you at the next session. Um, don't forget to fill out your evaluations. Thank you.